a very entertaining and very educational evening. So I'm going to get on with my presentation. I want to thank all the people, by the way, from Audiovisual and Communications who helped me put this together and are here for my emotional support tonight. So it's entitled, Private Parts, A Lecture for Mature Adults Only. Now, don't get me wrong here. This is not exactly a discussion of female anatomy. First of all, this has been censored by the uh, people in communications. So I've got to watch what I'm saying. Many members of the audience I see may have pacemakers, so I was very careful not to do anything too dramatic here. And more importantly, my in-laws may or may not show up. So I had to, you know, I had to select what I was going to put in here. All right, this is the outline of what we're going to talk about tonight. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about what the parts are, so you understand a little bit about normal female anatomy. I'm going to talk about how people get pregnant naturally, not kind of the birds and the bees, but a little bit of the science behind it. And these days, more and more, how people are getting pregnant artificially. I'm going to talk a little bit about preventing pregnancy. I'm going to talk a little bit about prenatal diagnosis. The pap test, which everyone knows about but doesn't really understand. And a little bit about women's problems. That should be the best part. First of all, these are the parts. So, women in their pelvis, as you see, have an, their reproductive organs. And they're actually quite small uh, in the non-pregnant and non-diseased state. The average uterus is about the size of a pear when a woman's not pregnant. When she ages, it gets even smaller. It's an amazing organ because it can expand, as you know, to accommodate one baby or two babies or three babies. The ovaries, which are right next to the uterus, are what produce the hormones that enable to a woman to have a menstrual cycle. So, in terms of the parts, they're all internal as opposed to the male, where they're external. And this is what a uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovary look like from the inside. This is a picture of a laparoscopy, which is where we put a little camera in through the belly button and look inside somebody's tummy. So this is the normal relationship of the uterus. I'm just going to get my little thing out here. This is where the bladder is in a person. This is a view, actually, of a person lying down on an operating table. So if you're the surgeon and you're standing where I am, their feet are over here, their head is over here, and this is a look inside the person. So the uterus is here, the colon and rectum are over here, and the bladder is over here, and here's where the ovaries sit. Now. What's the most important sex organ? Brain. The brain, right, because everything that regulates the menstrual cycle starts at the brain. Now, if you stop for a moment and think about the menstrual cycle, this is a pretty amazing thing. You think that for the average woman who actually, let's say, theoretically never got pregnant, this starts at 11, 12 years old, sometimes younger, and the average age of menopause is around 50, 51. Every month, like clockwork, the brain selects one ovary, one egg, from the ovary to be the egg of the month. Now, if a woman becomes pregnant, that egg gets fertilized. And if she doesn't become pregnant, that egg sort of just dissolves and disappears. It's an amazing process. For some women, it is amazingly predictable. They know 28 days to the date from their previous period that they're going to have cramps and pain and a period. And they know it for two to three days in advance because they have craving for chocolate or chips or get crabby. They have the normal premenstrual feelings. And all of this is actually regulated, first of all, in the brain. There's an area in the brain called the hypothalamus. It's part of the brain that controls a gland called the pituitary gland. And that part of the brain sends out two hormones as a message to the ovary every month. The result is that the ovary picks one egg. That egg develops. And if it's fertilized, becomes pregnant. If it doesn't fertilize, the egg actually sort of dis just disappears and dissolves, and a period comes the next month. So the message that starts this whole process comes from the brain. Message from the brain to the ovaries. The ovaries produce these two hormones called estrogen and progesterone, which affect the lining of the uterus in a very predictable, reproducible way every month. When things don't go right, a woman doesn't have regular bleeding. She has totally screwed up periods. She doesn't know when she's going to expect a period. And that's normally a patient who's going to come to see a doctor to say, hey, what's going on with my periods? Again, this is sort of a busy slide, but I'm going to make it simple. These two hormones are the hormones released by the brain. These are the hormones that are produced by the ovary, estradiol or estrogen and progesterone. And if you look, the endometrium is the lining of the womb. So what happens is during the woman's period, it's released and it slowly grows and grows and grows. 
By day 14 of a menstrual cycle, this new hormone called progesterone comes in and helps the glands prepare for a pregnancy. If a woman doesn't get pregnant, the message to the lining of the uterus is for it to shed again and another period comes. So the woman's cycle is something unique to women. Men don't have this, obviously, and this is responsible for normal fertility. This is just to show you the ovary itself. What ovaries are fascinating. Actually, a woman or a female fetus has the most eggs she's ever gonna have when she's still a fetus. In other words, when a female fetus is inside her mommy's tummy, she has about 20 million eggs. By the time a female fetus is born, she has about a million eggs. What's fascinating is of those million eggs over a woman's whole lifetime, maybe four or 500 are actually chosen every month. The remainder of the eggs, we don't know what happens to them. This is different because men produce hundreds and billions and trillions of sperm and can produce them as we know until their late 80s. Whereas for women, fertility is more limited. We know more or less from the age of 13, 14 till menopause, which is about 51, that's theoretical. We know that after 40, a woman's fertility drops quite a bit. So women are, are limited in terms of fertility by biology. And what limits them is the number of eggs and the lifespan of an egg. What happens when someone gets pregnant? So the egg is relief, released and they meet that meets the sperm in the fallopian tube. The cells multiply, and eventually, about a week to 10 days later, it gets implanted in the wall of the uterus, and that's the beginning of a pregnancy. Once this happens, the body releases a hormone that becomes positive, and that's the basis of a pregnancy test. So, pregnancy test becomes positive only once the fertilized person, which isn't a person yet, gets implanted in the uterus. And it's amazing these days what we can see on ultrasound very early in pregnancy. For example, this is an, a normal pregnancy ultrasound around 35 days. Now, it doesn't mean the bit, little baby there is 35 days old. This is 35 days from the woman's last menstrual period. So it means it's about 21 days from the moment of conception. So three weeks from the moment of conception. In other words, this is one week after she missed her period. We can already see on ultrasound First of all, a sac in the uterus, a little black hole. And within that sac, we see another little round thing which is called a yolk sac. This is something that's going to help in creation of the baby, of the embryo. A week later, we can already see the embryo itself. So this is about two weeks after a missed menstrual period. We see a sac in the uterus. We see this yolk sac, and here is the human being. When it's about three, three millimeters actually in size, we can already see the beginning of a fetal heartbeat. By the time it's five millimeters, five millimeters is teeny weeny, we can see a heart beating on ultrasound. So it's amazing what we're able to see. And this view, which looks more like the little embryo, here you can recognize as the embryo's head and its body. It looks like a little shrimp. Chas v'chalila, not the Jewish general hospital. <laughs> kind of like, like, like that rubbery shrimp you get from Ernie's, the caterer. That's going to make the chronicle for sure. <laughs> so by nine weeks from the missed period, you actually see a recognizable human being. And the whole diagnosis of problems early in pregnancy is one based on ultrasound. Today, with ultrasound, we know what's going on. And the ultrasound for early pregnancy is actually done through the woman's vagina. We put a little probe in the vagina. It sounds a little bit, oh my god. But it's actually a not painful exam, and we get amazing amounts of information. We can also tell when pregnancies are not going well. This is an example of an abnormal pregnancy, and this is always very sad because a woman's thrilled, and she feels pregnant, and her blood test is pregnant, and her boobs are sore, and she's tired and nauseous and feels pregnant, goes for an ultrasound, because maybe she had a little cramping or a little spot of blood, and what we see is an embryo, but we don't see a heartbeat. And there are a few things that look abnormal. That little round yolk sac thing isn't there. The sac that the embryo itself is in is a little bit irregular. So we can know very early in a pregnancy, and we're able to predict this one is going to go okay, and this one is destined to miscarry. There's certain things we can tell very early in pregnancy that tell us what's going to happen. Not all pregnancies are in the right location. There's something called an ectopic pregnancy. This used to be much rarer than it is now. Now it's more common for two reasons. One, there's a higher prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases, which scar the fallopian tube. This is a picture 
bilaparoscopy again with a camera inside the patient's tummy of a pregnancy in her fallopian tube. This is a potentially very hazardous condition because a woman can have internal bleeding and die. In fact, this remains one of the major causes of maternal death in North America, ectopic pregnancy. Less so in Canada because people have access to care relatively early in their pregnancy. In the States, many people don't see a doctor and, and show up in an emergency room in shock. Pregnancies were not meant to stay in the fallopian tube. It's not an organ capable of withholding a pregnancy. So what happens is sooner or later it bursts and the woman bleeds and go into shock and, and it's a very serious condition. This used to be almost always something that we saw as doctors. Patients showed up in the emergency room in shock and needed to have surgery. These days we're able to see these very early on ultrasound. And in fact, the treatment of this condition these days is medication, not surgery. When we recognize this early in pregnancy, we give an injection of a medication that causes the pregnancy to stop growing. So within the past 10 years, the treatment for this condition has gone from surgery to, me to medical. The other reason for the increased number of ectopic pregnancies is the big increase in assisted reproduction. In other words, test two babies, all that kind of stuff. That really increases the chance of ectopic pregnancy. So this remains uh, uh, like a serious entity. So we're going to switch gears for a second, look a little bit about infertility, because this is a sort of a hot topic and everybody's always interested. First of all, it's fairly common, about 15 to 20 percent of couples, this is not a woman problem, right? A thousand years ago, the woman was barren. That's not the case. We know that fertility or infertility is equally likely to be a male problem as a female problem. Basically, 40 percent male, 40 percent female, 20 percent combined. And uh, that means that this is a couple problem, and the couple needs to be seen when they're not getting pregnant. Some interesting facts about human reproduction. If you take two completely young, healthy people and allow them to have completely unprotected intercourse, the chance of a woman getting pregnant any given month is only about 20%. I want to use turning to your neighbor and saying, you know, I got pregnant three times. It happened on the first shot. I was so fertile. <laughs> OK, maybe that was you. But in general, 20% per cycle. After three months, about 50%. After uh, six months, about 75%. Unless you're from Wabriant, where they have incredible fertility. <laughs> That's a different story. Mit a little help from the Rebbe. If you're not pregnant in three months, it's already a scandal. <laughs> so what are the female causes? Blocked tubes, number one, normally from sexually transmitted diseases. The scary thing about a lot of these, quote, social diseases, as you may have called them in your era, is that many of them are, the women are asymptomatic. They don't have symptoms. There's no pain, discharge, discomfort. Chlamydia is the most prevalent sexually transmitted, it's sort of a bacteria virus thing. Probably about 30% of young women have been exposed to it. It's very, very common. And unfortunately, women don't know about it until it's determined that they have this because their tubes are found to be scarred or blocked. The other major problem is a hormone problem women who don't ovulate. These are normally women with very irregular menstrual cycles for a variety of reasons. Could be your thyroid, it could be other metabolic problems, but that's the major other group of infertility problems. Then there are specific conditions. One is called endometriosis, which is a condition where the lining of your uterus, which is supposed to only be in the lining of your uterus, grows in other parts of your body. It causes a lot of pain, painful periods, painful, painful intercourse, and uh, infertility. Age is the other major issue. We know very clearly that women's fertility after 40 drops dramatically. Uh, up until 35, it's pretty reasonable. 35 to 40, it drops. And after 40, uh, unusual to become pregnant. The really frustrating type of infertility for patients are patients with unexplained infertility. I really, really feel for these people. I have to tell you, as a, as a training doctor, that was my greatest fear, that I would end up with this condition. These are people who've been through the ringer. He's been tested, she's been tested, she has normal menstrual cycle, her tubes are open, she's healthy, and nobody has an explanation for why they can't get pregnant. Very frustrating, very stressful for the couple. And in fact, today's modern treatments will improve the fertility of these people trying to get pregnant. It's also important for patients to know we sort of wait for about a year because most couples will become pregnant within a year. The likelihood that a couple that's become, been trying to get pregnant for a year gets pregnant in the next year is under 5%. It's very unlikely. So actually, by two years, it's, it's almost hopeless on your own. And you really should see a doctor these days. This is just a slide which shows you fertility 
and the likelihood of having a miscarriage related to the mother's age. This is a very recent publication from the New England Journal of Medicine. And basically, if you look at fertility, here's age increasing on this scale, and uh, fertility rate or likelihood of having a miscarriage increasing on this scale. As we see, as a woman ages, her fertility drops, and it really becomes dramatic here in the late 30s and 40s, and the likelihood of having a miscarriage increases. The reason is her eggs are old, and old eggs don't fertilize easily, and there's a very high rate of chromosomal problems. You're all aware, you'll become aware in a few seconds, that as a woman ages, her risk of giving birth to a baby with Down syndrome, the other term for that is a mongoloid baby, it's a bad term, the term is Down syndrome, increases quite a bit. So, what treatments do we have available? We can give women drugs to make more eggs, that's injections of hormones to make them release more eggs. We can do surgery to fix their tubes. We don't do that anymore because the in vitro treatment I'm gonna show you works better. We can do direct insemination. Now, here's where people get confused. They talk about artificial insemination. And is it the husband's sperm? Is he the father of the baby? Artificial insemination simply means taking sperm and rather than the couple having normal sexual relations, the doctor injects the sperm directly into the uterus. It's believed to improve fertility because of some women have a mucus in their cervix that's kind of, quote, hostile to the sperm. That's different from donor insemination where the case is the, the father is unable to, to produce sperm, so somebody else's sperm is used to inseminate the woman. And there are these new treatments which are available, and they're all available here at McGill. McGill has a world-class fertility center at the Royal Victoria Hospital, and Dr. Tan, who's the chairman of our department, actually lent me a few of these videos quite graciously for, for me to share with you. But the procedures I'll show you are IVF, which stands for in vitro fertilization. That's test tube baby. ICSI, which I'll show you, which stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. It means taking a single sperm and injecting it in the ovary. And IVM, which is something I'll maybe leave because I don't want to give you too much information. There's also the possibility of egg donation. In other words, if you're an older woman, find somebody else to donate you an egg, and you carry that egg inside your uterus. So you've carried the baby, but biologically it ain't your kid. That's different from surrogacy, where let's say you don't have a uterus because you had a treatment for a cancer, but you still have your ovaries, and they take your eggs and your partner's sperm and get somebody else to carry the baby. Sounds like a good deal, eh? No varicose veins, no <laughs> swelling. Obviously, there are a lot of ethical issues here, but in that case, biologically, the kid is yours because it's your genes, but you didn't carry the baby. So these are two different things, and these things are all available today. What's the big picture for in vitro? First of all, scary looking lady. I don't know why, she doesn't even look female in this picture, but anyway, <laughs> they give her an, an injection of hormones. The woman is given an injection to make a lot of eggs. And then the eggs are retrieved. Now that sounds, how do they retrieve the eggs? What they do is under ultrasound, they put a probe in the woman's vagina and with a long skinny needle, as I'll show you in a couple seconds, they poke the ovaries, which have swollen up enormously, to suck out the eggs. The eggs are then mixed in a dish and fertilized with the husband's sperm. They're grown in that dish for a few days till they become embryos, humans. They are then put back into the woman's uterus and she carry, hopefully if things go well, she carries a baby. This used to be experimental. This isn't experimental. This is mainstream already for 10 to 15 years with pregnancy rates of 35 to 40% by doing this. So this is not anything, this is standard, standard stuff. It's as standard as you know having a bypass done or anything like that. Let's show you the picture. See, they're sucking up a single sperm Okay, that's one little t teeny sperm. Normally, hundreds and hundreds of millions fertilize an egg. This, in this case, it's normally a husband whose sperm don't work very well, or he has very, very few sperm. So these days, men who weren't able to become fathers, even 10 years ago, were able to become fathers. And they're injecting that single sperm into the woman's egg. This is called ICSI. It stands for intracytoplasmic sperm in the music's depressing sounds like schindler's list i'm listening to this gonna cry it's like terrible now this is what normally in normal th these slides are the other way from what they're inverse sort of what i wanted but this is what an egg looks like surrounded by zillions of sperm they're all really trying their best to get in only one wins 
Only one of these hundreds and millions of sperm is the one that actually gets in there. And once the egg is fertilized, we don't understand how, but Mother Nature makes it so that all the other sperm are rejected. Talk about rejection. <laughs> so the previous slide is, is high tech, but one step higher than this. This has been around for already 20, 25 years. The first test tube baby was like in the late 1970s. The previous slide has been around for about 10 years. And at the VIC, they're like almost world champions in doing this. Now we're going to change themes completely. <laughs> I am. I did. The sperm, the sperm are tough. Okay. Only the survival of the fittest. So now we're going to change themes in just about a second. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't talk about complications of fertility treatment. It's all not rosy, right? We all know that there are potential complications. The biggest fear is multiple pregnancy. We know that the risk of pregnancy increases dramatically when you go from twins to triplets, and you've all heard cases of four or five or six or seven. These days, because the treatments have gotten better, they don't implant five babies back into mothers. Normally, it's, it's not more than three. Prematurity, birth defects are actually not more common with all of this technology. And of course, there's an enormous cost and emotional side effects to parents who go through this, get pregnant, miscarry, and have to go through the whole thing again. So it's not easy. All right, now we're going to switch themes and talk about preventing pregnancy because there have been a lot of developments in that area too. So, I mean, philosophically, it's interesting. Some people try so hard to get pregnant. Other people get pregnant, try very hard not to get pregnant. What are the options? Well. At the Jewish General Hospital, abstinence is not really uh, an option for us here. Culturally, it's uh, unacceptable. The more uh, likely options are the pill, the IUD, which has made a major resurgence. I'm going to talk about two new things that have only become available in Canada in the past year, the patch and the ring. First of all, th there's an enormous amount of public misinformation and ignorance about contraception. This is the result of a Canadian survey about methods of contraception that people are aware of. Everybody is aware of the birth control pill. People are certainly aware of vasectomy. This is a very popular method of contraception among women because there are very few side effects for the woman. <laughs> very unpopular around men. Condom, tubal ligation, but when you get down to all these other things, people aren't really aware of them or don't really think highly of them. Let's talk first of all about the birth control pill. Birth control pill is the most widely prescribed medication on the planet for like 40 years, okay? More people, more healthy, normal people have taken this drug than any other drug known to man, and it's the best studied and understood, and despite that, people are still misinformed. First of all, it is very safe with the exception of giving it to the wrong patient. So we don't give it to people who are heavy smokers who have other multiple, other medical problems. It is very effective. If you miss pills, it's less effective, and that's generally why people get pregnant. Not because they're on it, but because they forget to take it. How does the birth control pill work? It, it does a few things. One, the most important thing it does is prevent that message that I showed you at the beginning of this talk from going to the brain to the ovary. So that the ovary doesn't get a message to release an egg, and the woman doesn't release an egg. That's primarily the main way the birth control pill works. It also makes the uterus a very inhospitable place for a pregnancy. The Hormones change the lining of the uterus to make it inhospitable and also causes the mucus in the cervix to become sticky so the sperm can't make it and, and it frustrates uh, their attempts to, uh, to get the lady pregnant. Let's go through a few misconceptions. First one, that it causes cancer. The truth is nothing could be further from the truth. The other one is that it causes blood clots, heart attacks and strokes. Kind of true, but let's put that one into perspective that it affects your fertility in the future, and that it makes you fat. The truth, birth control pill is about the only thing a woman can take to prevent breast, uh, sorry, to prevent uterine and ovarian cancer. We know that long-term use of the pill reduces the risk of these cancers in half, and that is well-studied, incontrovertible, scientific, solid information. In fact, since ovarian cancer is a bad disease, 
since Jewish women in particular are, are at increased risk and women who carry a gene for it are at increased risk, even in those patients, it's been shown that use of the birth control pill reduces the risk of both ovarian and uterine cancer in half. There's no other medication I'm aware of that has such a profound effect in terms of preventing cancer. It does not increase breast cancer. There's no evidence that shows that at all. Now, in terms of causing blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes, this is exclusively limited to older women who shouldn't have been prescribed the pill. We do not give the pill to women over 35 who smoke heavily or who have other medical problems. The risk of getting a blood clot on the pill is higher than women not taking hormones, but it's still only a third of the risk of getting a blood clot if you're pregnant. So compared to pregnancy, which is what the pill is to prevent, it's much lower. There is no effect on a woman's fertility with the pill. How does this one come up? It comes up because a woman's been on the pill for years. She forgets that her doctor put her on the pill because she was having totally irregular cycles because her hormones were screwed up in the first place. When she goes off the pill, she says, no, I'm not getting pregnant. It's the birth control pill you gave me. It's not the birth control pill. It's her own hormonal problem that predated her use of the pill. There, this stuff is washed out of your system in 48 to 72 hours. There's no delayed effect on fertility. Studies following women caref carefully shows the birth control pill does not cause any appreciable weight gain. There's some bloating and fluid retention in some women, but in most cases, not the case. The IUD is something that was old, that fell out of favor because there was uh, a lot of problems with the older IUD. Women developed bad infections, scarred their fallopian tubes, and could never have kids. Today's IUD is different. Uh, it, it's something called a Mirena, and it's a little thing that sits in the uterus and releases some hormones. It's very, very effective in preventing pregnancy. It also has a whole bunch of other benefits for women, including reducing the heaviness of their periods. What's new is this, a little patch. There's a little patch that you put on your skin once a week, and it's 99% effective in preventing pregnancy, just like the birth control pill. This became available in Canada about a year ago. And like many of the patches that women use for other medical problems, menopause, hormone replacement therapy, it's very well studied. You can take a shower with it and bathe with it and have a normal life with it, and it works very effectively. The other thing that works is a little ring. There's a little ring that you put in your vagina which releases hormones over a three-week period, and it's also become very popular and become available. And it just has to be put in the vagina, stays there, and these methods both work like the birth control pill. They release hormones, they interfere with the message that comes from the brain every month. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about prenatal diagnosis. About one to 2% of human beings have, quote, a birth defect. Birth defect means a lot of things to a lot of people. So we have to distinguish between what we can find out before birth and some that we can't detect. There are physical problems. That means, God forbid, spina bifida, which is like a, a malformation of the spinal cord, a missing finger, a missing foot, a heart defect, something wrong with the brain. These are things that ultrasound is very good at looking at because we can actually see these things on ultrasound. Then there are genetic problems. That's something wrong with your genes, where you may look normal, but this may be, uh, the, the good example is somebody with Down syndrome. These babies often look normal on an ultrasound examination, but when they're born, you can't see on ultrasound the things in their creases or the fact that they have a thick tongue. So this is a genetic problem. The problem is not all are detectable. Many in the past required a woman to have an, a kind of dangerous test which put her pregnancy at risk to know that the baby was normal. This is the most common abnormality that we look for, Down syndrome, okay? This is a problem where a, a baby or a person is born with one extra chromosome, chromosome number 21. The result is a typical face, and we've all seen it, oriental type uh, eyes, a big tongue, uh, and uh, mental retardation, heart defects, the problem, or not problem, depending on how you look at this, because it's a philosophical issue. Some people believe we shouldn't be testing for this because it's a, it's a crime and a sin to abort babies like this. I don't want to open that whole discussion, but other people feel differently. They want to know, because if God forbid they have a baby like this, then the baby may need to be institutionalized. And people with Down syndrome, some lead very full lives, other don't, others don't lead such great lives, and they lead them for 50 and 60 years. So, the the, the Funny thing with this condition is your risk of having a baby like this increases with your age. So that when a woman is 25, her risk of giving birth to a baby with Down syndrome is about one in 2,000. When a woman is 40, her risk is one in 100. 
When a woman is 44, her risk is 1 in 40. Having said that, 80% of babies born with Down syndrome are born to women under 35 years old. So most babies with Down syndrome are surprise, surprise at birth. Doctor, how come you couldn't tell us? Because we can't tell you normally. 50% of babies with Down syndrome look normal on an ultrasound. They have nothing on the ultrasound exam that tells us there's something wrong. Since most babies with this condition are born as a surprise, they have developed a test which doesn't put the mother at risk because the only test available to check for this condition was an amniocentesis. Amniocentesis is a test where under ultrasound, a needle is put into the sac where the baby is, some fluid is drawn out and analyzed. Normally that goes very well, but there is a one in a hundred chance of miscarrying or losing that baby by having this test. Now there are all kinds of patients out there. There are 38 year old women who have four normal kids who say, I'm willing to take that chance, I have four healthy babies and I absolutely don't want to look after a kid with Down syndrome. There are 38 year old women who've spent their life trying to get pregnant, have spent $50,000 in three years and are finally pregnant and do not want to take a risk of losing this last chance at having a baby. So what's the alternative? The alternative is this, which is really fascinating. It's been reported and used worldwide now for close to 10 years. It's a measurement of the nuchal translucency. I hope you can all see this. This is a profile of a baby in the mother's uterus at 12 weeks of pregnancy. At 12 weeks of pregnancy, a baby is this big. That's five centimeters, nothing, that big. And at that stage in pregnancy, we can already measure and look for two things. This is just to orient you. This is the baby looking up there. Its forehead, its nose, its mouth, back of its neck. Do you understand the view? Okay, and I'll, I'll repeat, at 12 weeks of pregnancy, many women don't even know they're pregnant at this stage in the game, right? Three months from the last period, two and a half months from when you missed your menstrual period. By looking for this marker in the baby's nose, it's called the nasal bone, we all have a bone in our nose, and measuring a fold of skin in the baby's neck, in addition to taking some blood from the mother, none of these things are dangerous for the baby, we can detect close to 90% of Down syndrome without any risk to the mother or baby. Now the test is not foolproof. We miss a case here and there. Normally that's in overweight mothers where we don't get a good ultrasound picture. And there are anywhere from one to 5% false alarms. In other words, patients said, the patient's told there could be a problem. You're gonna have to do an amnio because your numbers don't look good and the baby turns out to be normal. But that's the price we pay for at least making this technology available to women of all ages, not just women over 35, because I told you before that most babies with Down syndrome aren't born to women over 35. They're born to women as like a total fluke at any age. And this is what it looks like when it's abnormal. We don't see the no nasal bone, and this fold of skin is very, 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 very thick. So all of this is fascinating because the doctor who sort of uh, you know, discovered this was a doctor who looked at a very old report which described how people with Down syndrome look and, and the original report by a guy named Down, Langdon Down in 1890 was that they had very thick necks. So he thought to himself, why don't we look on ultrasound and see if the fetuses have thick necks? And this is what they noticed. So this is a safe, non-invasive way of looking for Down syndrome. Now the, my favorite part, women's troubles. I always love that. It's a woman's problem. You've got to see a woman's doctor because you have a woman. What are they? Painful periods, heavy periods. Fibroids, we'll talk a little bit about fibroids. We'll talk a little bit about cancer, women's cancer. And women's biggest trouble, of course, is men. I'm not gonna talk about men, not tonight. I don't have the time. This huge lump is a gorgeous example of a fibroid. I'm gonna talk about fibroids because this is really the most common gynecologic pathology. Many women have them. You know, many women get, again, are sort of misinformed. These are very common. Fibroids this big are very uncommon. This is a patient I operated on, so I took a picture of it because it was so big. Actually, if we look closely by ultrasound, 20 to 50% of women have fibroids. These are benign little growths of the muscle of the wall of the uterus, and they are very, very, very common. Fortunately, most women have no symptoms from these at all. They don't know that they're there. Once in a while, a doctor says, hey, you know, did you know you had a fibroid? The patient says, listen, nothing's bothering me. However, it is the most common reason that a woman has a hysterectomy. Hysterectomy means surgical removal of the uterus, and it's why gynecologists got a very bad reputation, really until the past 20 years, that 
every woman needed a hysterectomy and you had to have your uterus out. Now we're much more conservative in rec recommending that. Despite our conservatism and attempts to be politically correct and not recommending surgery to every woman who may or may not benefit from it, it still remains the number one indication for removal of the uterus. But there's also the option of, of preserving the uterus if it's appropriate. Appropriate means a woman who still wants to have babies. Fibroids, like everything in life, it's location, location, location. <laughs> you can have a very huge fibroid growing outside your uterus and be totally unaware of it. You could have a very teeny fibroid growing inside the cavity of your uterus. This is where the lining of the uterus from which a woman bleeds every month. And if you have one here or here, despite its size, it can cause a lot of tsuris. Do I need to translate tsuris? Trouble. So. When things get out of hand and the patient has never seen a doctor until somebody says, hey lady, you look like you're pregnant, and we find out that she's not pregnant, this is an example of a huge uterus. This is actually a patient that I looked after who came to see us when she was pregnant, and she was only pregnant about three months, but she looked like she was carrying triplets, and she had this huge fibroid, and sadly, the, she miscarried around five months of pregnancy. She came to see me after because clearly when you have a fibroid this size and you've lost a baby, you ain't gonna stay pregnant with a lump this big. Now, this is a picture of surgery. So this is a picture with the patient's, this is her abdomen open, these are her kishkas, and this is this huge, huge fibroid, okay? In her, I did a procedure called a myomectomy. We're actually able, quite nicely, if you, if you know what you're doing, to peel the uterus and remove this huge fibroid which is inside of it. You'll see there's very little bleeding because I use a special technique so that you don't use, lose a lot of blood. This is an example of this done, to, as we can do these days, by laparoscopy. In other words, without cutting the patient open. Here is a fibroid which is being shelled out. Everybody had supper already or not? <laughs> okay. Are they okay? Who's fainting? Are they all right? This case is being done by Dr. Tulandi, one of my associates. Some of these are, are technically uh, safely done through a telescope. Most aren't, this one was. And see what he's doing here is burning and pulling and cutting and tearing. Okay, so that's a view by laparoscopy. And here's a view at the end, your very handsome speaker with his handsome assistant and the huge handsome fibroid. They don't pay us by the pound, unfortunately. What can I tell you? At the end of the deal, we sew it all up, and I'm pleased to report that this woman is actually pregnant. And I'm looking after her now. She's about five and a half months with a totally normal pregnancy, a totally normal uterus, everything's going beautifully. A little bit about minimally invasive surgery. People also are mixed up about this. They say, I want to have it done by laser. We don't use lasers for very much in our specialty. Don't confuse the term laparoscopy, which means going in through the belly button with a camera and not cutting the patient open, and using a laser, which sounds so high tech, but a laser is good for a very few things in medicine. We don't remove huge growths with a laser. We burn little things with a laser. In our specialty, we don't do too much. So laparoscopy is simply a way of doing surgery that avoids a cut. Endometrial ablation is a new technique where actually instead of removing the woman's uterus, we simply destroy the lining of the uterus so that her heavy bleeding stops. It can be, and I'm not kidding, microwaved, fried, frozen, poached, zapped, broiled, you name it. Everybody's b built a machine to do it. But it's a way of not having to remove the uterus and curing the problem without major surgery. The other neglected method of minimally invasive surgery is that in women, many gynecological problems can be approached vaginally. In other words, instead of making a cut through the tummy, you do the surgery vaginally, including actually removing the uterus. A woman's womb can be removed vaginally, particularly if it's falling out. That's a condition called prolapse, which is a very common condition. I'm going to talk to you a few minutes about the pap smear, because women don't know what a pap smear is, what it really looks for, what it's all about. The pap test is like the biggest success in the history of medicine. Okay? Mammography doesn't hold a candle to what the pap test has achieved. This is without question the most successful screening test in the history of medicine for a variety of reasons. Number one, women in this country, they don't die of cervix cancer. It's the number 11 or 12th cause of cancer death among women in North America. It used to be number one. It remains globally 
the number one or number two, depending on where you are, cause of cancer death in women. So worldwide, this is a disease that still kills women. In North America, it doesn't. The reason it is a completely preventable disease, because if you go for a pap test, in 99.9% .9 of cases, in medicine, nothing is ever 100%, but pretty close, it's preventable. The reason is that it's, we know now that this is a cancer which is caused by a virus, and the virus is a sexually transmitted virus. This information has become crystal clear in the past 10 to 15 years and is the basis for a lot of new work in this field. So, pap tests save lives. Pap tests have prevented this disease from happening. In, just to put it into perspective, about 400 women a year die in Canada of cervix cancer. Compare that to the thousands who die of colorectal cancer or breast cancer. It's, it's way down on the list. This is a pathology specimen of cervix cancer. And this is the uterus, and normally the cervix is a little small thing. Here it's expanded by this huge growth. The problem with cervix cancer is that by the time a woman presents with symptoms, it's very late in the disease. The symptoms of cervix cancer would be bleeding after intercourse or pain. And by the time a woman has those two symptoms, it's very, very late in the disease. Early in the disease, there are no symptoms, but we can pick up the abnormalities by doing a pap smear. And women should be encouraged to have a regular pap smear sometime from the time they become sexually active till the time in their late 60s. I'm going to answer any specific questions later, but that's the, the big picture. What does the pap test do? Up until very recently, what it did was look for abnormal cells on the cervix. So, this disease is related to a sexually transmitted virus that, listen to me carefully, almost all human beings will pick up when they're sexually active early in their 20s and 30s. So, in the past, it used to be sort of like a scarlet letter. My God, you had an abnormal pap test. You must have been screwing around. It's not the case. Studies show that this virus, the HPV virus, or human papilloma virus, is very, very prevalent. Prevalent means common. In women in their late 20s and early 30s, about 30 to 40 percent of them will carry it if you randomly test a large group of women. And if you look through a woman's whole lifespan, by the time you reach 75, somewhere around 75 percent of women will test positive for it at some point in their life. And it doesn't mean you've had multiple partners. It's just there. There are many types of virus, about 80 viruses in this family. Some are good and some are bad. The good ones, if you're lucky, just cause warts, which are socially a little embarrassing, but go away. If you're unlucky, you pick up the bad viruses, which if they stay in your body for a few years, and gratefully, most of the time they don't, because your immune system takes care of this virus. If you smoke or have other problems, that could be an issue. But in most cases, the virus hangs around for a year or two and you get rid of it. If you're unlucky and you don't get rid of it, the virus works on the cells of the cervix and turns them precancerous and with time cancerous. This is what a cervix looks like. The cervix is the very opening of the neck of the womb. And a normal healthy cervix looks like this. It's covered with a skin, very much like this kind of skin. But it, it's also covered with another type of skin which is very susceptible to this virus. And if the virus gets, gets a foothold there and isn't eradicated by the body, with time, you develop precancer. What your doctor does when he or she does a pap smear is to basically take a little scraping. It's not a scraping, we're not scratching, we're just lightly collecting these cells and they're analyzed under a microscope to see whether they look normal or not. It's not a foolproof test. There are many false alarms and there are also missed cases where we just are unable to pick things up. Up until now, the testing for this problem was all based on a tired, overworked technician looking at millions of cells every day and saying, well, this one looks funny, this one looks okay. Now we're able actually to test women to see whether they carry the virus itself. That's good and bad. The good is by testing for the virus, we're, we'll miss very, very few cases. The flip side, like any test in medicine, is where when it's a very sensitive test, there are also too many false alarms. So we end up scaring a lot of women by saying, guess what, you have this virus, everything looks okay, but I can't tell you what's gonna happen in five years or 10 years. So that's sort of a good thing and a bad thing. It's not, not great psychologically, and it's been shown, for a woman to know that she carries this virus, but nothing's wrong with her now. When we look at, under the microscope at an abnormal cervix, it's actually interesting what we do. So the, the woman has a pap test and it's abnormal, and she's told by her doctor, you have to go have a colposcopy. 
Colposcopy is really nothing fancy. We put in an instrument, we look at the cervix, here is a cervix, here's the wall of the vagina, and what we do is actually smear some vinegar on the cervix, regular vinegar. The vinegar is taken up by the cells that are abnormal and they become white, the area becomes white. What we do actually is take a little biopsy, and with the biopsy we're able to see whether or not there are any precancer cells, and then we can treat it. The treatment is a procedure called a LEAP procedure. LEAP stands for loop electrocautery excision procedure. And what it means basically under local freezing is we take a little electrical loop and shave off this abnormal skin. What we've done in this patient is actually we also can smear iodine on the cervix, not the kind of iodine that you put on a cut. And areas that don't take up that iodine are the abnormal areas. This is an office procedure. It takes five minutes. It's done under local freezing. And in that five minutes, you can prevent a woman from getting cervix cancer. Once you get cervix cancer, it is a horrible, terrible disease to treat. Uh, it requires either radical surgery if you're lucky. That's if you're lucky. Mo mostly it requires radiation therapy and chemotherapy because by the time a patient shows up, it's far gone. So here's a five minute simple pap test. And if you go regularly, your chance of getting this disease is basically zero. We know that of the women who develop cervix cancer in this country, fully half of them report never having had a pap or have not having had a pap in the previous five years. That's half the cases. The other half, unfortunately, nothing's perfect. When we look back, somebody made a boo-boo. The technician missed it, the doctor missed it. Nobody's infallible. But getting a pap smear done is really a way of preventing this disease. Be clear that a pap test is a test for cervix cancer. It is not a test for uterine cancer. It's not a test for ovarian cancer, okay? I think that, I probably talked too quick, but I'm more or less finished. My final words. Please, my mother's in Toronto. Don't tell her what I do for a living. <laughs> this is the more important question. Don't ask me questions about your hormone replacement therapy the next time you see me at the Cavendish Mall. <laughs> I don't want to hear about you. I don't want to hear about your sister-in-law or your sister-in-law's friend. And I think that's it, folks. <laughs>